give God some glory and let's magnify his name. Oh, come on, saints, let's do it. It ain't but just a few of us. Well, two or three are gathered in his name. He said, there I'll be in the midst. I know he's in our midst. I know he's in the place. I know he's in our midst. He's given us breath to breathe. He's given us activities of our limbs. He blessed us to be able to walk in on our own. He blessed us to cry out on the altar. He blessed us to carry a noise, a noise of praise and worship. So, Lord, we ask that you will accept our worship. Lord, we ask that you accept our prayer and bless us now in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, saints. Come on and clap those hands. Come on, let's give God some glory. Let's give God some praise for his goodness. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Singing, oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other tongue I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part of this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing. This is my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Singing, oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No, oh, 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 no, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not the good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Singing, oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll be reading Psalm 71, verses 1 through 6. Yes. We're talking about the God, the rock of salvation. Yes, Lord. Psalm 71. In you, O oh Lord, I put my trust. Yes, Lord. Let me never be put to shame. Yes. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Yes. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge, to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me. Yes, Lord. You are my rock and my fortress. Yes. Deliver me, O oh my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For you are my hope, O oh Lord God. You are my trust and for, from my youth. Yes, Lord. By you I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. In thee do I put my trust. I just stood to welcome each and every one of you to Berean Holy Temple on behalf of Pastor Rashawn McCoy. We welcome the um, YouTube family, Facebook family. We welcome all of you in this service as we come together to just fellowship, worship God, and hear a word from the Lord because there is a word from the Lord. Lord, and if you just sit at your seat, get your Bibles, open them up, turn to the page, and read the words of God, listen as the word comes forth, that you not only be a hearer of the word, but a doer as well. Yes. I welcome you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on, clap your hands for Jesus. Let's give God a praise. We thank God for uh, you all being here today, and uh, we thank God for Evangelist Monroe and First Lady Robin for scripture as well as the welcome and greetings. Uh, briefly, we want to still announce that on the fifth Sunday night, uh, the, the New Horizon District, which we are a part of, will be celebrating uh, and observing First Lady Laverne Cooper, who is the First Lady of our district. And uh, God bless you. Thank you for that. And uh, we did ask that if you were able to do so, to share a $25 offering. And we're going to ask that uh, if you all will put that in your regular offering and specify, and we're going to ask Trustee Mark to write one check, and that way we will have a presentation uh, to offer her that night from uh, the Berea Holy Temple Church family. Also, our Holy Convocation would start on uh, August the 3rd. Uh, that would be Wednesday after the 5th Sunday, and we'll go through Friday. And uh, we pray and hope that you all uh, would come out and support that. Uh, that would be at the Upper Room Church of God in Christ uh, in Iowa Village. And um, that uh, day sessions will start at 10. And uh, we have um, lunch will be served that day. And then they will have night services as well. On Thursday night is Women's Night. And uh, Mother Dijanae, who is our state supervisor, will be in charge of that service. And so uh, we pray that you would be able to come. I think they're going to have some workshops that day as well as uh, a service that night. And I think they're going to probably be acknowledging some graduates uh, of the uh, Kojic Academy for NC3. So if you want to see how that is operated, please come out that night as well as Friday night and to see how things are going. I want to congratulate Sister Evangelist Monroe for finishing the first semester of uh, Coaching Academy. And she took a final exam, and the Lord blessed her with an eight. So we thank God for that. Amen. We thank God for that. And so we are uh, we're moving forward. We want you to don't get discouraged because we don't have that many uh, people in our audience. But the Lord has got angels here. And the Lord has given us a word that we can continue on in blessing his people as we uh, move forward. And at this time, I'm going to ask that you clap your hands for the Levite Network. And we can definitely go a little bit of this uh, with First Lady backing me up. And then we're going to go forward into the word. Uh, 
My God getting us ready for that great day. My God getting us ready for that great day. Oh, my God getting us ready for the great day. Through simply understanding. Yeah, my God getting us ready for that great day. My God getting us ready for that
we begin to turn the searchlight on ourselves, that we can recognize that we need to strip off some more things, uh, that we will be prepared to walk in the gate of eternity. Lord, I ask right now as we present the word of God, as we preach your gospel, as we preach your word, uh, that the anointing will fall on the hearts of those who are listening. Lord, and bless us that we do no damage to your word, but preach and teach that which is sound doctrine and holiness. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on and clap those hands for Jesus and give God a prayer. Turn me to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. And I'm just going to read one verse and then we're going to elaborate and touch on some areas leading to that verse. 17, chapter 17, verse 30 says, And the times of this ignorance God weeped but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Verse 31 says, Because he hath appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man, that man is called Jesus Christ, by that man whom he had ordained, he had ordained Christ, whereof he had given assurance unto all men. In other words, he proved himself to all men that Christ was a man because he says he had raised him from the dead. And I want to use for this subject this evening, God is not winking anymore. He winked then, but he's not winking anymore. In Acts 17, uh, we see that in the, from verses 1 all the way to verse 9, Paul was in Thessalonica preaching the gospel. And he made people mad. You go back and look at it when you get a chance. And he ran him out of Thessalonica. According to verse 10 through 15, he was in Berea. And this is how we came. The Lord gave us the name of Berean Holy Temple because the Bereans were a group of people that was considered to be noble. They, they, they acknowledged that they needed to search the scriptures first before they believed what was preached. But well, we come to find out that there were some Judaizers that was upset because it wasn't good that enough that Paul was ran out of Thessalonica, so now they are showing up in Berea, and the text says that they came to agitate and to aggravate not just Apostle Paul, but the atmosphere that the gospel was being ministered in. In other words, they came in to try to tear down what was being built up. And so, Apostle Paul moves out of Berea, and now he comes to Athens. While he is waiting in Athens, he's waiting for uh, Paul, he's waiting for Timothy and Silas to come and join him. He left, uh, he, he, when he left these certain areas, certain people was left behind. I think Luke was left back in Thessalonica, and, and Timothy and Silas was left back in Berea, and now Apostle Paul is waiting on them in Athens. And while he is waiting on them in Athens, uh, it was brought to his attention to just walk around and observe uh, and see the things uh, that were taking place in Athens. Uh, as he began to walk around the city and began to observe the scenery, he was walking around and he saw thousands and thousands and thousands of idols uh, that were set up everywhere. They were lined up in the streets. They were sitting on top of buildings. And they were inside the windows of people's homes. One earlier observer who went through Athens uh, made a statement and wrote that you will meet a god, a luji, God's first, before you will meet a man. 
And the statistics showed uh, that there was 30,000 idols uh, that was in Athens uh, compared to 10,000 people that lived there. In other words, uh, it was more individual idol gods, luji gods, uh, that were in the city than it was people. And so, uh, however, when Apostle Paul saw this, according to verse 17, uh, uh, 16 rather, he uh, was stirred uh, in uh, his spirit. Uh, it says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, and them was preferring to Timothy and Silas, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. In other words, that stirred mean that he was greatly angered. Uh, he was aggravated, he was irritated over the spiritual blindness of man's mind uh, and reason uh, and against the devil's enslavement of these people's lives. Uh, oh, it kind of reminds me today, are we stirred in our spirit when we see how that man is blinded to the things of God? And how that the devil is steady in trapping people mentally and not seeing the things of God. Therefore, according to verse 17, Paul, he couldn't wait for the boys to come. So he went to the synagogue of the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles in the marketplace every day. He went there every day to dispute what was he was seeing within the city. And as he was disputing with them, he was talking about the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ. History said that he went there every day, every day in the public square. In other words, the Gentiles was in the marketplace and the Jews was in the synagogue. And he communicated with them back and forth. Uh, that word dispute means that he was trying to reason with them. He was discussing the matter. He was debating as well as proclaiming the gospel uh, to them uh, of Jesus Christ. And while in the midst of discussing the issues of the idols in Athens, uh, according to verse 18, uh, two predominant rival schools of philosophy... The Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers began to engage in conversation. Oh, these men began to engage in the conversation. And when they heard Paul talk about Christ and him crucified, they said, What's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he has picked up? In other words, uh, they were saying that it seems that he is preaching about some other foreign gods uh, instead of the gods that they were familiar with. When they called him a Babylon, that Babylon means uh, uh, birds picking up seed here and there. You ever seen birds? Uh, they won't just pick up seed in one spot. They are walking and picking and walking and picking. This represents a person who is always collecting various ideals and teachings uh, and uh, second-handed thoughts and second-handed theology and coming up with their own terminology or their own theological way of thinking and spreading. If you can let your mind go back, we have a lot of that that uh, are within the body of Christ. We call it syncretism. They have picked up knowledge from uh, 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 the oneness doctrine. They have picked up doctrine uh, uh, from the, the, uh, the, 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 the faith doctors, uh, uh, the, those who are uh, 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 in the same category with people like Crumpho Dollar and John Hagee, word of faith doctrine. Uh, now they picked up doctrine from the Amy Zion Church. They picked up doctrine from the Pentecostal Church uh, and their minds are screwed up because uh, it has took them away from the doctrine of the scriptures. Uh, here, these people here looked at Apostle Paul as being a stupid person and talking nonsense. They said because Paul was talking about a resurrection, uh, they could not witness to the message. Uh, here, remember, he talks to the Epicureans, uh, who were a group of philosophers that believed that the world happened by chance. Uh, and by accident, uh, this is one of the spirits that came with the Big Bang Theory that God did not create the heavens as well as did not create the earth. 
They believe if there are gods, little gods, uh, they are remote and disinterested in the affairs of men. They also believe there is nothing after death. There is no heaven or hell, no reward for punishment. Man simply returns to become part of the dust of the earth. They believe in pursuing pleasure. Pleasure was their chief purpose. In other words, we want to do things that please the flesh, that gives us our own peaceful lifestyle. We want to be able to pursue, pursue pressure, I'm sorry, pleasure without having to deal with pain, without having to deal being disturbed. They were very superstitious, and in their superstition, they believed that death was nothing but just to go back to the dust, and there was no life after. They chased after the lovings. They chased after the love of fine things. They chased after fine food. They chased after fine clothing. They chased after the things of the earth. In their motto, they believe just enjoy life. Oh, enjoy life to the fullness. Disregard of what it may cost to get it, just go after it and get it. Then you had another group of people that was among Paul called the Stoics. Uh, they were a group of philosophers uh, that believed uh, that self-control and discipline uh, is something that you should practice. They believe in uh, fatalism. When, when, whatever happened occurred uh, because it was supposed to happen. There is no good or evil in the world. Things are the way they are and happen the way they do because they are destined. There is nothing Anyone can do about the things that happen. Good lies in the soul itself, which through wisdom and restraint delivers a person from the passion and desires that trouble ordinary life. They believe that a person who can endure pain or hardship without showing their feelings or complaining will be all right. They reject idol worship, idolatry, and pagan worship and taught there was only a world God and therefore they stressed on personal discipline and self-control. Their motto was uh, just endure life. One motto was we're going to enjoy life. Uh, the other motto was we're just going to endure. And after listening uh, according uh, to verse 19 and 20 after uh, they have heard Paul talk about the resurrection uh, verse 19 through 21 says uh, and they took Paul uh, to Mars Hill uh, this, this Mars Hill was a place where uh, the city councilman was meeting in other words the city councilman uh, they regulated the religion and they regulated the thought process of the people when they arrived, they told Paul, they said, hey, uh, we need to know about this strange teaching that you are proclaiming. For you bring some sterling, strange things to our ears. Uh, and so we need to know uh, what you mean. Paul says uh, here that when these people came, according to verse 21, these Epicureans and Stoics and all these philosophers, when they come together, they always come together talking about different things that they have heard, uh, trying to narrow out what they exactly was going to believe. Uh, but Jesus Christ was not one of the ones that they were talking about. So uh, when they invited Paul to come to Mars Hill and express this around the council board, uh, Paul stood in the midst. According to verse 22 of chapter 17, he stood in the midst, in the center of these men and said, Men of Athens, observe with every turn I make throughout the city. He said, Everywhere that I walk with inside the city, outside the city, I noticed that there were very schools of religious idols and devotions that y'all had to these idols that you gave high respect. And now, as I was going along and carefully looking at your idol gods and your worship, I came across an altar, uh, an altar that was inscribed to an unknown God whom therefore you are ignorantly worshiping. 
Oh, he says here, uh, I come across this and it stirred my spirit. Talking about an unknown God. All the other gods had names. Uh, but this one particular altar was unknown. And so Paul here begins to preach his message in verses 24 through 29. Paul, in preaching this message, he brought out six points. Uh, you will find starting in verse 24. When he says, uh, when he was preaching, he said, God who created the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Uh, in other words, he says, uh, these temples that y'all built around here, would that be idols in it? He says, the God that I'm talking about uh, don't just dwell in the building. He says here, he rules over everything in heaven and in this world. But he does not live in the buildings that you have made. It kind of reminds me of how church folks are treating God's house. They don't recognize God until they come in the building. And because of that, it makes me think that the only time I want to reference who God is, is whenever I come to the church. Verse 25, Paul points out, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything because it is he who gives to all people life and breath and all things. God does not need anything from the people because everything that exists belongs to him. In other words, God don't need the money because he owns the money. God don't need the land that you would give him because he owned the land. He don't need your automobiles. Uh, he said because, uh, because he lives and he moves and he has his being within us. In other words, uh, he says he exists uh, and because he exists, we exist. Uh, according to verse 26, the third point uh, that Paul wanted to bring out was, he says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the, and the boundaries of their lands and territories. He says, uh, when the world began, he said, God just took one male, uh, and that was Adam, uh, and he created the race. Uh, he created Man and woman. And God produced all nations out of that one man. And he made a decision on where the nations should live and how they should mingle and how many years they should be in place. The fourth thing that Paul talked about was in verse 27. He said, this was so that they would seek God. He says, this happened, God allowed it to happen this way so that y'all can seek him if perhaps that you might grip to who he is and find him and that he is not far from each one of us. In other words, he says, God done this so that mankind could seek him. So that mankind could grip to him uh, and find in him uh, and search for him. God wanted them to find the need of needing him. My brothers and sisters, uh, that's all God wants us to see is to show us that we need him and that he exists and that he is there for us. Uh, fifth thing he says here, for in him we live and move and exist. That is in him we actually have our being. Uh, as even some of you own poets, in other words, uh, the poets of uh, that area even acknowledge the fact that we were God's children, although uh, they didn't know which God that we need to address, uh, but they understood that this particular unknown God, the author, he said that we were all his children. So, uh, in verse 29, Paul says, So then, being God's children, we should not think that divine nature, deity, is like gold or silver or stone and in the image form of the art, imagination, or the skill of man. In other words, he says, uh, the God not talking about 
is not the God to be looked at as silver and gold and stone. In other words, uh, you can't make an image of him uh, and think that you got the right imagination. Uh, and understand, saints, these people in their minds uh, had an imagination of what they thought God was. And in their imagination, uh, some thought God to be a sex goddess. Uh, some thought of God to be about rain and, and to be about food and to be about clothes. Uh, and it kind of reminds me of what's happening today. Uh, we have people that have made a God out of their food. Uh, they have made a God out of their money. They made a God out of their clothes. Uh, their house is a God. Their job is a God. Their car is a God. I hate to say it, but some of their pastors and leaders they made a God out of them. They look at them as if no, they can't do no wrong. And they will they'll be willing to sacrifice everything for the preacher but won't sacrifice nothing for Jesus. Paul says here, he says here, and because of this mindset, he says here, God in verse 30, he tried to make it plain, he says, therefore God overlook and disregard the former ages of ignorance. In other words, he said God had patience with man sins uh, and ignorance temporarily. He overlooked their sins and held back his divine wrath. Why? Because uh, they didn't recognize what they had and what they were dealing with. So he says here that the only way that they are going to know I'm going to send somebody uh, I'm going to send my son uh, that's going to come here on this earth. He's going to come through a virgin by a lady by the name of Mary. And he's going to walk this earth. Uh, and he is going to be the example. Uh, he's going to be the witness uh, to let it be known that, that I exist. Uh, that Zeus don't exist. Uh, that uh, 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 Plato doesn't exist. Uh, Aristotle don't exist. Uh, but the God that made everything exists. Uh, he says here, he says uh, that in times past, uh, as we said here in this verse, of, uh, it says that the ignorance of God, God winked at it. And that's what the word weak means. He temporarily, uh, evangelist, he temporarily uh, put it to the side and, and he showed patience with man. He showed that he's going to be patient with you until you receive the information. And the information that he gave them was about Christ. In other words, uh, Paul was telling the Epicureans uh, and Stoics, he said, as God, uh, they've been patient with your ignorance. Uh, he's been patient with how you have viewed him. Uh, but because he has ordained uh, a time such as this uh, uh, for me to be here in a place uh, to expose who is this unknown God, uh, he says, God now commands all of you uh, to repent. Uh, that is, change your old way of thinking. Yeah. To regret your past sins uh, and to seek God's purpose for your life. Uh, in other words, my brothers and sisters, uh, what I'm trying to show you is uh, that if you were ignorant to the things of God, uh, the Lord had designed to where that you heard about Jesus. Uh, yeah, 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 you might not have jumped the first time you heard about it, but as long as they've been talking about Jesus, uh, how he came here and suffered, bled, and died. How that he came for the sins of this world. In other words, God put the right information in place. He put it there so that you can realize and recognize that he came as a sacrificial lamb. He came that man would get back in fellowship with God. He came and he suffered. But that man can get right, right with the Father. Because God got tired of sacrifices coming to him year after year. Month after month. Killing the animals on the altar. Telling them, telling God how sorry they are with their mouth. But did not mean it in their heart. So God says, I'm going to sin the last sacrificial lamb. And his name is going to be Jesus. That's why Jesus 
Jesus has forgotten so now the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life in other words saints you that are viewing me on Facebook you that are viewing me on YouTube God and God sent you the information. And that information is Jesus. And he showed you the grace of God. He showed you his mercy. He showed you his patience. And he let it be known. And I went a long time ago about your interest of me. But now I didn't sit I'm not going to wink anymore because you know better. Because I don't put something in your conscience. I don't put something in your heart to let you know that you are wrong from the inside out. And you say, the reason why I'm not going to wink anymore because verse 31 says, because he is set up a day. He has set up a day of judgment that he's going to judge the world in righteousness uh, by a man who he has appointed uh, and destined for the task. Uh, and that man's name is Jesus. Uh, God uh, has got a designated day uh, when judgment is going to fall uh, on this planet, on this earth. Uh, and he's going to allow uh, his son to be the judge uh, souls say yes uh, he said this man uh, that is my son uh, he said I proved uh, to everyone uh, that he was my son uh, because I loved him to be crucified uh, I loved uh, him to be stabbed uh, pierced in the side uh, I loved uh, his hands uh, his head crowned with thorns uh, allowed uh, the people to spit on him and to ridicule him uh, and call him by his name uh, and because I did it I uh, allowed uh, him to die uh, and go in the grave uh, and on the third day uh, he rose uh, yes he did no doctor uh, could make him raise up can push his heart, can pump his heart, can shock his heart, can break him back. Nobody has the power to raise him up. But God, he raised him up. And when he raised him up, he proved to mankind. I raised him up for your sake. But let it be known that when he died, he went into hell and got the keys. And he came out with the keys in his hand. I've done that to prove to the world that my son came here for a purpose. Therefore, he's going to judge every man according to him. He's going to judge every man about your witness. He's going to judge the liar, the cheater, the immorality, the drunkard. Yes, he is. He's going to judge the selfishness, the selfish man, the man with bitterness, the man with pride, the man with anger. Yes, he does. 
of the residue of the word that will be in our minds and heart that it may feed us and bring us to a point of repentance that we will turn from our own way of thinking Lord we thank you Lord we adore you Lord we magnify your name in Jesus name we pray come on and clap those blessings we're going to ask that you go ahead and get your offerings together